Hello, hello, and welcome to the worst review ever that I am throwing together right now because one of my kids is sick. So, period three, crazy stuff happening, post-classical period, a.k.a. the Middle Ages, a.k.a. the Dark Ages in Europe. It's very scary. It's like super scary stuff. Okay, so uh, we have three subunits to unit three. Remember, there's 600 to 1450. Uh, first, we're going to look at uh, basically trade and how there's just more trade. So it's like the same from the earlier units where you're getting the Silk Road and all that stuff. But now there's just more of it. And then you see uh, new and continuing states. And they're getting bigger. Everything's just kind of increasing. And then uh, more production of things and consequences. Let's focus on the first one. There is an increased volume of trade during this time period. It's over a longer distance. And there are new trade routes. And there are existing trade routes. Unit 2 to Unit 3 is a lot of more of the same, but bigger. More stuff traded, more people trading, larger distances covered in the trade. So old trade routes are going to grow. Powerful cities will grow up like these. Novgorod, Timbuktu, Hangzhou, Calicut, Baghdad, Malacca. And the trade routes that are old, that continue, are the Silk Road, Trans-Saharan, Indian Ocean, Mediterranean, etc. So let's label these guys. And there you go. So you see those trade routes, you see those cities. Um, do you need to know every specific thing about these cities or trade routes? No, but you should be able to mention them as centers. Economic centers, political centers, cultural centers. And um, you should know what areas of the world are linked together. So East Africa gets linked to Southeast Asia. Why? Because of the Indian Ocean. There are some new trade routes and centers during the post-classical period. But they're still pretty isolated. In Mesoamerica, you have the trading cities, city-states, and empires of Tenochtitlan, the Mayans, the Aztecs. Then you have, in the Andes, you have um, basically going along the mountain ranges. And you have the Chavin, the Moche. And this will be the precursors to the Inca. And then in Mississippi area, you even have some smaller areas like Cahukia, the Mound Builders, Snake uh, Mound, all that stuff. So you can look at that there. Now, there doesn't really seem to be any evidence that they were engaged in direct trade with each other, so we don't think the Incans were trading with Cahukia, right? But there does seem to be some smaller scale trade. Remember, the, the Americas got off to a late start, so they're always a little behind on their trade and economic development and all that stuff. Let's talk about what's getting traded. So there's innovation in trade and technology, and we're starting to get more luxury items traded. Give you a second. Here is a fun vocabulary word. <laughs> caravanserai. All right. That was a caravanserai. There it is. There it is. Okay. Compasses. The astrolabe. Larger ships. And some economic innovations. Credit. Bills of exchange. Checks paper, money, and coins. Now, all those mean, hey, trade's going to increase. We have more stuff to trade. We have a better technology to trade. And we have better ways to, better ideas of economics. So we can trade more, better, faster, stronger. What's the state doing to support trade? Well, in some areas, they build road systems. You have some... Um, political affiliations like the Hanseatic League, and it's a political economic affiliation, and that's going to be in Northern Europe. You also have trade fairs that are sponsored, with some dudes playing like a mandolin, and there's a jester somewhere, and a guy's got puffy pants tucked into socks. That's what I think all medieval fairs are, right? You also have the Mongols during this time, and with the Mongols, what do you get? You get them taxing merchants, realizing merchants are very profitable, so they protect merchants. What's this? Anyone? Anyone? The Grand Canal. So starting in the Sui Dynasty, continuing on in the Tong and the Song Dynasty, China connects their two major river systems of the 
Yangtze and the Huanghe or the Yellow River, and that's going to be used for economic activities as well as obvious political military activities too. So we're going to have an increase in trade and an increase in interactions. What two empires are shown here? That's right. China and the Byzantine Empire. We also have Dar al-Islam, the Islamic world. Uh, Islam giving protected status to merchants, um, not being able to raid fellow Muslims, um, the, I, the history of Muhammad himself being a merchant. So we see Islam tends to promote trade, promotes merchant activity, and you get this kind of shared cultural, sometimes political system. I say sometimes because, you know, Dar al-Islam goes much farther than just the caliphate, even at the caliphate's largest extent. We also have the Mongols. Even when divided into their separate khanates, they still supported trade. They support it so much that, of course, it's going to inevitably spread the do-do-do black death. So expanding trade depended on technology and knowing the environment. What are some examples of people uh, having in human environment interaction and new technologies? Well, the Vikings had long ships. They were ships that were long. They had sails and they had oars. They could be used in rivers because they had shorter hulls, or they can be used in open water. You have the use of camels and caravans from North African Berbers and Arabs. You also have steppe nomads using them horses. Nay. You're going to have migrations that have an environmental impact as well. Our good old friend, the Bantus. The Bantus are going to have an impact spreading. Basically, Central West Africans are going to spread to much of all of Southern and Central Africa. So this is the Bantu migration that's shown here on the map. What three things are they spreading? Iron, agriculture, and language. What's shown in this map? Make way, make way. It's the Polynesians. What are they spreading? Language, agriculture, pigs. So migration spread languages. The Bantu spread their language. The Polynesians spread their language, but then also, what's shown here? Turkic languages are spread. What causes this? The Mongols, other groups, Seljuk Turks, Ottoman Turks, all these groups are moving around, the Delhi Sultanate, the Mughals. They spread the Turkic language around. And finally, oh, that's a little cut off there, but the Islamic expansion spreads Arabic, and so now in many parts of the world that are very far from Arabia, you have people who are speaking Arabic, or at least some sort of highly Arabic-influenced language. Next, you have new networks leading to an increase in cross-cultural exchange. Um, you get this new religion in this time period, Islam. What is Islam based on? Islam is based off of older Arab religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, mixed together. It spreads through the three M's. First, it's through military conquest. Then a lot of it is spread through merchant economic activity. And then later on, you get some missionary activities with Sufi Muslims. For the most part, though, unlike Christianity and Buddhism, we don't see as much missionary activity in Islam. You also have cynicization. Sino or Sina, that's going to mean China, okay? That means China is spreading their cultural language practices, Confucianism, etc., to different parts of East and Southeast Asia. We see this with you know Japan adopting a Chinese alphabet, Confucian practices, Korea doing the same, Vietnam doing the same, etc. And we also have trade diasporas. So what's a diaspora? Scattering of people. Uh, this can be by force, like the most famous one I think is a Jewish diaspora, but many of them here are going to be trade diasporas. The Chinese, Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, the Sogdians, they will move. Oh, and Jews will also be involved in trade diasporas as well. That's the Sogdians there. They will move uh, to different areas taking with them their languages, their, their religions, their cultural values, and they'll create little miniature pockets of their own culture in different communities, and that's a trade diaspora. Also with networks, 
You get networks leading to more travelers and increase in travel and trade. What does this map show in green and red? Well, in green, you have Ibn Battuta. In red, you have Marco Polo. Sorry for that late title there. And networks lead to more travelers, which leads to an increase in travel and trade. Marco Polo, what about this one? That is Wang Zhang. He is going to... Wang I totally nailed that. He is uh, going to travel in from China into South Asia. He's going to learn more about Buddhism. What's the most important thing from each of these people's travels? Well, there's so many to choose from. But for those of you who love Fiesta, it is said that Europeans first gazed upon what would become the Cascarone when Marco Polo traveled to China and saw Chinese keeping spices and perfumes inside of hollowed-out eggshells. Viva Fiesta, kids. More interactions means diffusion of literature and cultural ideas, such as religion. We have Christianity in Europe spreading to Germanic regions, England, Russia. You also have the split between Catholic and Eastern Orthodox because of the geography separating Western and Eastern Europe. What about in East Asia? You have Neo-Confucianism, and then you have these new versions of Buddhism, Chan in China, or Zen Buddhism in uh, Japan. I think it's more famous as Zen Buddhists are more famous, but it's pretty much the same thing as Chan Buddhists. Zen Buddhists comes from Chan Buddhism. And in Southeast Asia, you get some Hindu Buddhist influence as well. Think of Sri Vijaya and other places like that. Also, Islam, that's the big mover in this time period. It's created in the post-classical period, and it spreads very quickly. Did you hear that snap? Very quickly, okay? Hopefully half of you didn't just disappear. <laughs> so topical with my humor. Anyway, uh, what about cultural ideas in the Americas? Well, you have some major cultural centers in America. You have the Aztecs in Mesoamerica, the Mexica and the Toltecs. You have the Incas in the Andes region, and so they're going to be the dominant group spreading a lot of their cultural ideals, values, norms, etc. to the people around them. Let's get some illustrative examples of diffusion of scientific and technological innovations. I would love to. Spread of knowledge thanks to Darul Islam. Look at this pic. Can you identify several important things? I can. We're at the House of Wisdom, there's books, there's ideas, use of the astrolabe, the cross staff, geometry is happening. there's a globe, there's paper, all right? Greek and Indian mathematics will influence Islamic scholars, ideas that the Indians came up with like decimals and accurate measurements of pi and basically what becomes algebra. Muslims take that, they expand upon it, they write it down, they spread it. Greek science and philosophy will also move around, especially through Al-Andalus. Remember, Al-Andalusia in Spain, that caliphate breaks away in the second caliphate. And then you have this little hybrid culture of it's European, it's Spanish, it's Arab, it's Muslim, it's North African, it's Jewish, it's Christian, it's everything, man. And so you're going to have this little vector for ways uh, for Islamic learning to make its way back into Europe through Spain. Uh, also, where do we get some of these new technologies like paper, gunpowder, which is going to move along? This will be, come from the Battle of the Tallest River between the Abbasid Caliphate, based out of Baghdad, and the Tang Dynasty in China. They'll fight to see who gets to control Central Asia. Muslims win that, and you have then more of a Muslim influence over Central Asia. But guess what? Rice, paper gunpowder, things that were invented in China or somewhere at least in East or Southeast Asia make their way into the rest of Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe through the Islamic world because they interacted with it in this war. So pretty important stuff. So here we go. Gunpowder from China. That sound was really worth it. Paper and printing. We get organisms as well. Crops, pathogens. What are some of these new crops? What are some of these new crops? What are some of these new crops? Bananas. New rice varieties. Cotton, sugar, citrus. Thanks to the Islamic world. What about diseases? Well, this map shows the spread of the bubonic plague. 
kills 25, one third. We're not really sure of the population. Slows trade, doesn't end it. It does weaken empires, though. The Mongols may have increased the standard of living in Europe later. Remember PQ equals MV? No? Okay. But what about 3.2? Yeah. Dig that crazy music, d- d- dude. Anyway, 3.2, the beginning. Empires fell before, some rebuilt. There's some new ones. Let's look at some rebuildings and continuations. We have the Byzantine Empire. Instead of centered out of Rome, it's centered out of Constantinople. But that happened before Rome even fell. And does Rome really fall? It's, we've just picked this arbitrary date of 476 CE. Okay. Um, it has Roman traditions, but with new ideas. You get roads and all that stuff. You get Christianity, but it's going to be its own form of Greek Orthodox, which later just becomes Eastern Orthodox, with the ideas of Caesar Papism, that the Caesar is more important than the papacy. You also have China rebuilding. After the Han Dynasty falls, you just get some smaller dynasties that were not full dynasties, but the Three Kingdoms. And then finally, the Sui, the Tong. The Song takes over. The Sui, like the Qin, they're strict short-lived they do a grand infrastructure with the grand canal just like the chin built the first great wall and then the tong dynasty comes in you start getting confucianism back especially neo-confucianism towards the end of the tong dynasty and all throughout the song dynasty uh you get one of the largest geographic sizes of china with the tong dynasty you even get empress wu uh there's more of an influence of buddhism and taoism especially with the imperial groups because especially empress wu buddhism taoism tend to be less patriarchal she was a female ruler okay but towards the end of the tong dynasty you do get foot binding and then that's going strong by the song dynasty and really it's just getting more and more chinesey as we go along Now, new or rebuilt empires, how do they get their legitimacy? How do they get their power? Well, they have traditional sources of power, and they also have new innovations. What are the traditional sources? Well, patriarchy is a big one, right? Foot binding, veiling women, um, keeping property rights only for men. Religion, right? With religion, you have obedience. Frequently, you can say, hey, the ruler is ordained by God or the ruler is a God. And now that's changed now in this time period where you have rulers, you know, basically the leader of the world. So in Islam, you have the ruler also being the caliphate, the successor to the prophet, doesn't have any prophetic visions or anything like Muhammad would, but he has a considerable political amount of power, and that comes from religious devotion and all that. You also have the ideas of, uh, like, the mandate of heaven still in China. Um, Caesar papism, we discussed that earlier, but basically the Caesar picks the leader of the church, and everyone follows the church, therefore everyone's kind of following the leader. Ah, yes. You have religious authorities like the Pope crowning the leaders of the quote-unquote Western world of Europe. And you got your own old land-owning elites, the aristocracy, the landed gentry, nobles, aristocrats, the scholar gentry class in China, okay? Uh, The theme system, um, serfdom, you know, making the peasants stay on the land and they're, they're controlled through like an almost form of slavery with serfdom to the nobles above them. What are some innovations and sources of power? Well, they have new tax systems like in Europe. In the Islamic world with the jizya, the tithe in the Christian world, China having taxes being paid in currency. You have tributary systems, the tribute system in China to Korea, Vietnam, the steppe nomads, etc. And then religions are changing here, which are going to give political authority too. With Neo-Confucianism in China, Confucianism comes back, but now it's more of a religion than it was before. This schism in Christianity between Eastern Orthodox and Catholic, and now all of a sudden you have a Western European religion and an Eastern European religion. And so the Byzantines have their own religious authority, and the Franks have their own religious authority. You have the Sunni-Shia split which will manifest itself much more in the next unit between the Safavids and the Ottomans. And you have some new governments. Various Islamic states, Abbasid, Muslim, Iberia, Delhi Sultanate, 
the Mongol Khanates, the Italian city-states, city-states in East Africa, Southeast Asia, America, uh, Swahili, etc. And feudalism in Japan and Europe, most famously. So let's look at these new forms of governance. Here you have the caliphates. What's shown in this map? Ah... Uh, you have the Mongols, the great Khans, the Khanates. They're, they have leave local leaders in charge in many places, and they have a lot of tolerance, unless you go against them and then they kill you. What do we see here? Do 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 do. What about here? Do 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 do. What about here? Do 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 do. Well, we see some city states. East African, Italian, Southeast Asia, Americans. Based on trade, there's usually a local king or prince or chief or someone leading that silly state. Silly state, city state. Although, let's just let's just call them silly states. Oh, yeah, those were your examples there. Venice, Florence, Swahili, Mombasa, Mayan, Srivijaya. What do we see here? F -f 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 Feudalism. Japan and Europe having very similar systems with very similar levels. More, we have in Southeast Asia, the Chola, Srivijaya, and Khmer. Here's Mesoamerica. What society is shown here? The Mayans. Like the Greeks, they have a shared culture, but no empire, just separated city-states. We also have a mixing of local and foreign traditions. The Abbasids sort of use satraps in their like, dividing of the government into provinces. They put the capital in the you know, important Persian city of Baghdad. There it is. Japan uses Chinese culture. Confucianism, they have an emperor, they adopt a Chinese alphabet. And then here we have in Islam talking about you know the importance of the Persians here we have the Chinese influence on Japan zoomed okay <clears throat> what about the Americas there was emperors and it was an empire in the Aztec in the Incan system in the Americas all right let's talk about state support for transfer of technology and culture Inadvertent or purposeful. The Abbasid and the Tang Dynasty through the Battle of the Tallest River give us paper. The Mongols help spread the Chinese invention of gunpowder. In the Crusades, Europeans go to the Middle East. Some of them settle there. Some of them come back. And what happens? They get exposed to many things from Darul Islam. Sugar, a rediscovery of Greek philosophy that had been preserved there by Byzantines and by uh, Muslims. Uh, new foods, citrus, etc., and from China to Japan, we get Neo-Confucianism. Now, a lot of these overlap with each other. Like, how many times have I mentioned Neo-Confucianism and moving of paper and all that stuff? Well, a lot. And you're going to keep hearing it because there's an economic side and a political side and all that to this. Towards the end of this, straddling this time period, you get the Ming Dynasty in Zheng He, or Zheng He, because I speak a Mandarin so good. Anyway... You have the several voyages he do. It's just an ex it, he he do. <laughs> uh, no edits. We're just we're just doing this as fast as we can. So I don't care. Stop laughing, kid. Anyway, there are these uh, voyages. They're really just an extension of the tribute system. Uh, they're a bit wasteful, and in many ways, they might also be the emperor's Muslim best friend Zhang He going on a Hajj. So they stopped them, but man, were they awesome! Bringing back you and other things, unicorns that looked kind of like giraffes, because whatever. All right, consequences of increased economic production. New techniques means more agricultural production. Ah, what's this? Chinampas, floating gardens. The Aztecs use them. They're pretty dope on a lake. All right, chinampas. There's waru-waru agriculture of raised beds using South America. Protects from floods. Protects from two floods? What's this? Ah, terrace farming. Terrace farming is used all over, but we see it in Southeast Asia and also all over the mountain areas of South America. We also have new inventions like the horse collar, which can let people 
use horses better. You get a heavier plow. This comes originally from China. Okay. Pictures. There's also a demand for luxury goods, which means there's an increase in production. Textiles especially. Cotton, silk, wool. Increase in this means people are producing more, so you get more wool production and cotton production coming out of South Asia. You get more silk production coming out of East Asia. Porcelain production. Even in this time period, the Byzantines will eventually learn how to perfect silk, though it won't ever be as good as the Chinese. Eventually, the Europeans will learn how to get porcelain right as well, but that'll take a little bit longer. What are they making here? Iron. Whoa. Some cities decline, some rose. And if you want to, you can just pause that and look at that. But what are going to be the reasons for declining and falling? Invasions, disease, decline of agriculture, the little ice age. What makes them rise? End of the invasion, better transportation, rise in trade, rise in temperatures, more farms, more people, more people, more labor. And you have examples of the cities at the bottom there that fell and the cities that rose on the top part of that one. Okay? Again, what leads to decline of these cities? Invasions. Diseases, decline in agriculture, and my backup SoundCloud rap name, Low Ice Age. Also, increased urbanization will help these cities. No more invasion, safer travels, economic increase, great warming period, increase in agriculture, increase in labor. Fun. Here's a nice continuity. Increasing in certain types of labor. Peasant farmers, free ones, as well as serfdom. Pastoral nomads continue to produce uh, animal goods. Craft production starts to increase through the use of guilds in Europe. Coers labor will be all over this time period. Serfdom, slavery, etc., Government forced labor, military conscriptions, these could all be seen as coerced. Coerced means like forced, you don't have a choice. There's variations to coerced. We'll see in Unit 4, it gets much more extreme with chattel slavery. We're not there yet. So, oops, well, I just, I guess, re recorded this. Anyway, you can't tell, but I just accidentally went backwards and deleted everything I just did. <laughs> classic. Anyway, uh, what else is going to happen? Uh, you have continuities and that things are pretty patriarchal. You have class and you have caste, but there are some changes. Mongol women are given some freedom. Uh, they can contribute equally. They have some status. Some of them may even do some fighting. We're not really sure, but we do know that if you weren't a Mongol woman, you were still kidnapped and assaulted. It really wasn't that great. So, <laughs> Take it with a grain of salt. In West Africa, there were some female merchants. They had some economic opportunities. In Japan, you had some female authors, property and marriage rights. In the Islamic world, you it was completely patriarchal. There's no doubt about that. But in comparison to what how patriarchal Arabia was before, there were definitely some improvements. What about coerced labor and resistance? Well, you have forced government work, like the Mita system with the Inca. The Aztecs do this as well. Uh, the Sui dynasty with the Grand Canal and all that in China. You have serfdom in Japan and Europe. You have increased slavery for labor. So the first like sugar plantations, which you really see take off in the, in the African slave trade. In the next unit, well, we see this happening earlier, especially in like parts of um, parts of the tropical regions around Africa and islands and stuff like that. We also have slave soldiers, Janissaries, Mamluks, etc. So continuing on some of that, you also have rebellions down here. This is a new part under the Sway, the Anlushan during the Tang, uh, the Bulgar revolt in the Byzantine Empire. And then religion is going to change gender relationships. Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Neo-Confucianism, it can make things more or less patriarchal. Women are to be respected in the Quran. There's things about divorce and dowry, later more strict with veiling and seclusion. There's always patriarchy there. The Song Dynasty brings in foot binding. South Asia is having the sati ritual where widows throw themselves on their husband's burning body on their funeral pyre. So that's not so great. But in Christianity and Islam, or Christianity and Buddhism, sorry, monks and nuns exist, which means people like women who are nuns, can get out of the normal lifestyle of having to get married and have children, and they can have some freedom for that. 
And that's it, folks. Thank you.